big screen. Oh, excellent. Good. I can never tell. <clears throat> um, so as I mentioned, this is a, a multi-year project that's funded through the USDA or NEFA, National Institute for Food and Agriculture. And it's actually paired with a summer institute. So we'll be able to accept more students because that funded students through um, a different program, but I, I'm managing them both because uh, the trainings really work out. And the idea of Envision is how is it that you see your future and what do you envision for yourself? Um, and on a personal side, I grew up in a family. My father was a bricklayer. Um, my mother was a bank teller. And uh, so my future, I, I saw kind of as, as working in construction. Maybe this is me at the age of, I think, three, helping my dad build our porch. But <clears throat> then growing up, I really liked snakes. So I wanted to be a snake scientist. About seventh or eighth grade, I, I fell in love with going out and catching snakes and I had a herpetology mini course in, in middle school. And <clears throat> so that, that was kind of what I wanted to do. So what did I do? Well, to be a, uh, a snake person. So what's that science called? The science of reptiles? Anyone? If you know what it is. That's herpetology. One? Herpetology. Exactly. I wanted to be a herpetologist, but you can't just go to herpetology school. Mm -hmm. You actually have to get a degree in biology first. So I finished a degree in biology and then I'm like, I don't want to go back to school for herpetology. And um, so DuPont was hiring people at that time. So I got to be a technician and they hired about 125 of my graduating class. So I was I was actually working with a bunch of people that I had been in school with, some people I knew from my my dorms growing up or going through school and even ones I were in, was in sports with. And then another guy I knew from school uh, said there was an opening full time at this other place. So it was still DuPont, but they studied immunopharmacology. So that's like how um, the immune system works and what drugs you can use to kind of manipulate that. So I was working for um, a, a protein biochemist on interleukin-2, and that's an important protein for activating your T cells. Uh, but she was from Transylvania and uh, she was a rough person to work for. But in the same lab, I was working also for this guy, Michael Kiefer, who was a molecular biologist. Um, so I kind of fell in love with molecular biology and transferred to another group under this guy, James Wong, on IL-1 signal transduction. So IL-1 is the thing that makes you feel so bad when you get the flu. Like everybody remembers kind of the first time they got the flu. It's like you feel sick. Within 30 minutes, you go from feeling okay to feeling like you're going to die. And the reason you feel like that is interleukin-1 beta. It's a pro-inflammatory cytokine. It activates your immune system, but it gives you a fever. It makes you feel achy. Um, and it's involved in a lot of autoimmune diseases. So um, the idea was if you understood how this worked, you could make drugs that could block it for say, um, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus erythematosus or other um, important autoimmune diseases. And then I worked over the summer in the same lab with Will Sisk um, on an HIV blood test. So at that time, this was the late 1980s, we really didn't have a good blood test for HIV. And so there were, there were cases where people, even famous people, died from AIDS because they got contaminated blood. So I was working on that and, and uh, both James and Will kind of like pushed me out of the lab. They said, you know, as a technician, you're gonna go as far as you can right now and you should go back, you're a young guy, go back to grad school. So I went back to the University of Delaware and I rotated through five different labs and started studying the molecular biology of this disease, Merrick's disease. Um, uh, with Dr. Robin Morgan. And then I thought, well, I'll go back to industry after I, I get my PhD. But I really fell in love with uh, uh, Merrick's disease. 
And as I was, I had a postdoc lined up at the Fox Chase Cancer Center in uh, Philadelphia, Northeast Philly. And I, I kind of made a breakthrough in Merrick's disease virus research. And I applied for an internal grant. Then I applied for my own USDA grant. And, you know, as a postdoc, if you have your own money, it makes you very attractive to other universities. So then I, I moved <clears throat> to a faculty position at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. And this, is, this was me. So I had no idea. I could never have envisioned being a professor at all. It was never in my wheelhouse or no one I knew had ever gone to do this. But it was these people that had kind of mentored me that gave me, you know, that changed how I envisioned myself. So I got to go there. And then um, in 2004, the woman who was my PhD advisor became the Dean of the College of Agriculture. And I got recruited back to her position. So I came back to Delaware in 2004 and have been there ever since. Um, but by, by going through this process, I got to see a lot of cool stuff. So I got to uh, go to this meeting and actually stay in this castle in the summer of uh, 1998. There was a, a meeting there uh, in Slovakia and Slovakia is, is really, really nice. It's like, um, that's where Pilsner beers originate. And uh, Slovakia is kind of the cheaper place to go than the Czech Republic. People go to Prague and that's kind of an upscale place, but Bratislava, uh, Slovakia, the, the capital city there is really, really nice and really old, a lot of cool things to see, but it's more inexpensive. And then I got to go and uh, give a talk at Oxford University, and we got to visit Blenheim Palace, where um, this is where Winston Churchill grew up. This was his family residence. He lived there. And then I got to work with people at uh, the Veterinary Medical Research Institute in Budapest, Hungary. And this is where Josef Marek was. So I study Marek's disease. This is the guy who discovered it. And I got to actually see the lab where he worked. Um, th this same old building in Budapest is where a bunch of the uh, animal virologists from the early 1900s uh, lived and worked. And I got to go back there to a, uh, gave the Joseph Merrick talk, the centennial lecture in 2007, got to see this lake, got to go to Australia, Townsville. And uh, I always would ask who's ever heard of Townsville? you know, the city of Townsville. There's a cartoon that started out that way. Uh, the Powerpuff Girls, right? Yes, exactly. Thank you. You're the first one um, in the, this these last recruitment sessions. And I, I was thinking that it's past the generation of the Powerpuff Girl watchers, but thank you. you. Yes. So every single one of those says the city of Townsville. Well, it's actually a place in Australia, Northeast Australia, that it has really nasty things. So in the winter, in like right around this time of year, they get freshwater and saltwater crocodiles. They have those, uh, the deadly jellyfish right on the coast there. And uh, so we were there in July, which is their dry season. So it's like their winter, but it's kind of like the Florida of Australia. So it was warm, but it wasn't, uh, a lot of the nasty things weren't around. Um, but me and this big Nazi looking guy, this is Klaus Osterreiter. He's like the head of a vet school now um, and the head of the uh, Virology Institute in Berlin, Germany. Teshime Mabastian, um, Tunisian. Uh, he's now a big uh, guy in the vaccine company or the animal health company called Beringer Ingelheim. Uh, but at that time, we, we had worked together on projects and we went, got to go to run around Townsville, Australia. And one of my postdocs is, is a professor at a, a vet school in China, and he got to take uh, me up to the Great Wall. This is the part of the Great Wall that you see in all the movies where they have something about the Great Wall. And we had uh, Ben Klaus actually hosted the meeting in Berlin, Germany. This is the Brandenburg Gate of uh, Germany, and we got to see some really, really cool things around Berlin. Um, and then in 2016, it was in uh, Tour, France. And we got to go to chateaus and stuff. And uh, back to uh, China in 2018. So again, the group that I, I knew there was hosting our international meeting. And this guy's daughter 
and his graduate student took me and my two graduate students to this place. It's called Wang Shen or the Yellow Mountain. And it has these really, you're like up really, really high. It has a, a cable car to get up around this mountain. It has these little stairs that go all around the edges of the mountain. Um, and this is with, uh, um, there, there's a Buddhist garden in the center of Yangzhou. Uh, Yangzhou is an interesting history. It was where Marco Polo was mayor. So Marco Polo was a mayor in China for several years. There's some poster, uh, big statues of him. Um, but this is a guy I'm working with in Nigeria, uh, Luca Jawander. He's isolated some strains of the virus I study, Merrick's disease virus that, that have broken through vaccines there in Nigeria. So I got to work with him. So the idea of this program is to provide you an experience that allows you to envision yourself as a scientist, not just a student. Um, so having a roadmap for this kind of career path, it, it requires a lot of mentors in your life, people that push you to try new things and to um, work on projects and have confidence in yourself. And so this Envision program, um, the first round was just called Envision. We call it UD Envision now because it's, it's faculty from across our college. So it's those in animal and food sciences, plant and soil sciences, uh, entomology and wildlife ecology, and uh, uh, applied economics and statistics. Um, and for each year, we have a extension scholar who does a video about the program. And this is the one from uh, 2019. Many can agree that educating the next generation of scientists to carry our future is important, and Envision is the platform for that education. This undergraduate research program is funded by the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and the USDA. It allows students to participate in agricultural-based research. This is an outreach program, meaning that it puts an emphasis on reaching out to minority groups that are underrepresented in the scientific field. In its third year since it was established, the Envision program hosted students from the University of Delaware, the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, Lincoln University, and Delaware State University to take part in this research. Working alongside UD's professors and graduate students, undergraduates were able to develop hypotheses for a summer project, which they could then perform research on to gain a better understanding of the topic as a whole. These students worked in the laboratory modules in the Star parking lot, Allen Lab, Delaware Biotechnology Institute, Townsend Hall, and the UD Farm. The 13 students conducted research that expanded over a broad range of scientific fields, such as animal health and disease, bioenergy and the environment, food safety and microbiology, genetics and genomics, physiology, immunology, and nutrition. Throughout the summer, students also attended laboratory safety trainings and multimedia trainings so that they could effectively perform and present their research. The students were then able to show their research off to the public at the Delaware State Fair in the Undergraduate Research Symposium, where they were also able to share their experiences with Envision. After all this hard work, students were glad to kick back and relax at the pizza and game night and at the beach. With being considered for another five years of funding, UD's Envision program is ready to continue to bring inspiration and education to the next generation of scientists. Yeah, so what do you do with this? Well, you get training in, of course, safety, what you're gonna be working with, responsible conduct of research, uh, video storytelling and editing. So you get a pretty comprehensive uh, videography course. Uh, so it's over the course of four different trainings. The University of Delaware has a, a wonderful multimedia center in the basement of the library that has uh, uh, a lots of video equipment, sound equipment, tripods, uh, studios for doing voiceovers, 
as well as the software you need to edit your video into a format and uh, training on how it is to make it really compelling. So you develop your project with your faculty mentor and then you document it with an e-portfolio. So like kind of an online notebook and you make a short video and the videos get uploaded to YouTube and then they get loaded onto these four gigabyte jump drive bottle openers. And we hand those out at the Delaware State Fair. So we actually show all these videos. And the beauty of it is we're like inside an air conditioned building um, because usually the state fair is kind of the middle to late July. So it's always like really, really hot and humid, but you get to be inside. And so people are always coming in to get cooled down and uh, they get to see your video. They get a jump drive bottle opener and we have some fidget spinners. And then um, you also make a poster for the undergraduate research symposium. So that's where all the projects uh, present across all the different programs at the university. And this year they're doing it virtually. So you actually pre-record your poster presentation and they have this kind of really cool um, web interface that you can, and, and you can see all these, it's, it's pretty neat way that they do, do this. Um, so the areas of faculty research interests are um, the same as we had had initially with Envision, plus a bunch of others. So animal health and disease, genetics and genomics. Um, we've added insect and wildlife ecology, um, nutrition and physiology and food microbiology and safety were ones we've had before, but we've added plant and soil systems, landscape architecture, bioenergy in the environment and public perception and food buying preferences. This is really cool. I'll talk a little bit about this. So the faculty that are contributing for animal health and disease are myself, um, Dr. Ryan Arsenault. He studies the interaction of um, the gut microbiome and the cells of the gut. And he studies immunobiology using some really cool techniques. Vincenzo Ellis, he's in entomology, and he actually studies a model for malaria, and it's a type of plasmodium, the causative agent of malaria that infects birds. So he studies the interactions of this uh, parasite with birds, and he also studies Lyme disease in ticks and, and the modeling of um, the epidemiology of Lyme disease. In genetics and genomics, there's Ben Mabosht. He studies genome-wide association uh, level studies on usually uh, physiological diseases. If they develop wooden breasts, like chickens develop wooden breasts or if, uh, ascites, or they have other kind of underlying genetic health issues, he works on what are the, what's the underlying genomic mechanisms. Uh, Amy Biddle, studies the microbiome of horses. So she looks at changes in the microbiome over the course of the life of, of horses, given different feeds, ones that have different parasites. So she does a lot of the genomic analysis of the microbiota of, the, of horses. In insect and wildlife ecology, Chris Williams is one of the nation's leading waterfowl, migratory waterfowl, biologist. So he studies patterns and um, energy usage of migratory birds, ducks, and geese. Deb Delaney, who you saw, um, uh, Mr. Brown, in the video, he actually was do working with her. Uh, she's a uh, bee genomics person. She has an apiary on the farm and has about 50 hives now. So she, she also on top of studying the genetics of honeybees and selecting for resistant to colony collapse syndrome, they also collect honey and make beeswax candles and stuff. Um, Tanya Gressley, uh, she uh, uh, studies the effect of different feeds on the immune responses in dairy cattle. Uh, Yi Hong Lee, one of our newer faculty, studies the patterning of absorption and metabolism as it is affected by early development. So it turns out that early stressors in, the, in your development can affect your metabolism for the rest of your life. 
and he's using uh, poultry as a model, but he's come from Michigan State where he was working in swine. So he also te teaches our swine production class. In food microbiology and safety, uh, Rolf Jurger studies uh, foodborne bacterial pathogens. Callie Neal studies uh, foodborne viral pathogens. So she's been studying nor human norovirus and, and models for human norovirus and its persistence in foods. But she's also right now, because of SARS-CoV-2, running uh, gen genetic tests for SARS-CoV-2 uh, genomes in the sewage of Wilmington and all of like Newcastle County, including the dormitories at the University of Delaware. So they, they're running a testing program to see what the viral load is and if it precedes a spike in COVID cases. Chang Ching Wu, uh, is a, her training is in food toxicology, but she studies nutraceuticals or foodstuffs that have like anti-cancer properties and identifying the compounds within foods that confer resistance to different types of cancers. Harsh Base in the Plant and Soil Sciences Department studies the interaction of bacteria and the root systems or the uh, rhizosphere in nitrogen fixing plants. Uh, many of these are important food crops and he's identified compounds made by bacteria that fight off pathogenic bacteria that can damage the crops. Um, has several patents on this. Uh, Jeff Furman, also a food, I mean, a, a plant microbiologist, but he, he also studies viruses that infect and kill beneficial as well as uh, pathogenic bacteria in root systems. Uh, Aaron Sparks does similar work, but she works with maize. She works with corn and their root systems. Um, then we have some that are, have been added in landscape architecture. Jules Bruck, she designs green spaces for city environments, but also does, uh, uh, usually has a display at the Philadelphia Flower Show each year, uh, which was postponed. Usually it's in January, but they've postponed it till May this year. And uh, Eric Irvin, the, the chair of plant and soil sciences, studies the interaction of root systems and turf grass, you know, increasing absorption as well as important production traits in turf grass. Uh, a new faculty member, Quing Wu Meng, he studies urban agriculture, like growing food crops in cities and using hydroponics and kind of vertical farming. Uh, Anastasia Chernside or Stacy Chernside studies uh, water ecology and the persistence of contaminants in the um, aquatic and sediment environment. Hong Lee studies uh, the use of environmental buffers in minimizing the impact of poultry production. So absorbing gases and smells, uh, lighting, how it affects poultry, as well as, you know, uh, what feed affects uh, nutrient management so they can use litter without it contaminating, you know, causing too much uh, overrun of nitrogen and phosphorus into the water systems. Now, there's Kelly Davidson from APEC, or uh, Applied Economics and Statistics, studies public perception of buying things, and it's usually agricultural food. So, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and they do these studies. And I actually participated in one of these where you take a survey while you're in an MRI and they're scanning your brain. And based on the blood flow, as you answer these questions, they get an idea of, okay, this is the part of the brain that's involved when you wanna buy something. So they actually get an idea of public perceptions, you know, and so, a lot of their stuff has to do with the use of wastewater. Like if you use treated wastewater in the irrigation of food crops, like some people would go, ooh, you know, what's, that would be yucky. But say you would use it on um, almond trees. You know, you just use the water to irrigate almond groves. Would you eat those almonds? 
Well, would you eat those almonds if they were a dollar less than one that ones that got tap water? And, you know, and by looking at your brain as you, you, you make these decisions, they see, wow, you would you would do that which is kind of weird, but that's what she does. She designs these kind of surveys and, and studies uh, buying preferences. So what do you get by participating in this program? <clears throat> well, our stipend has gone up $500. So you get to, uh, you get uh, $4,500 for the summer. It's a 10 week program. One campus housing, if you're coming from outside the university and need it, the use of the UD facilities, the library, the gym, and the outdoor pool. You get a research experience and $500 for research supplies for working on the project you develop with your faculty mentor. Um, you get experience in, in outreach to the public, hypothesis development, synthesizing concepts, and videography. So the, one of the key ideas in Envision is that if you have to make a video that's very broad strokes that, that you could it's like you're explaining what you're doing to your parents. So it's a very, um, um, yeah, you know, very accessible way that you have to explain your research project. You, you take more ownership for it. So it shifts your perception that it's not just a research project in this lab, but it's your research pot project. Um, we'll have some uh, industry visits, some. Uh, team building, fun activities. You would go to the beach. We have some game nights. And then um, you have fellowship internship opportunities. So some of the companies that we'll be um, visiting have longer term management trainee programs, other things. So you may end up getting an um, introduction to a job as well as graduate st uh, school recruitment. So one of the ideas is that, okay, if you do a, uh, work on a project that works out at the University of Delaware, then it may turn out that you, you stay, you know, after you graduate or come back after you graduate to do a master's here or a PhD. Uh, and you get to work in this. So this is, I'll show a little bit of this. This is our multimedia center. Hi, my name is Hannah Lee, and I'm an assistant librarian here in the Student Multimedia Design Center. Hello, my name is Brandon Blue. I'm a student assistant at the Student Multimedia Design Center in the basement of Morris Library at the University of Delaware. The Student Multimedia Design Center is actually the largest multimedia creation facility in an academic library in the nation. Down here, we work with a large variety of different audio and video software editing programs on the computers from iMovie, Final Cut Pro, Photoshop, all of Microsoft Office, different music softwares like Sibelius or GarageBand. We have hundreds of different kits that students can check out for free for a three-day learn. Cameras, tripods, microphones, we even have laptops and our iPads that students can check out. We provide the resources, the equipment, as well as the expertise that they need. Throughout the semester, people and staff at the Student Multimedia Design Center offer workshops for each of the programs that we have available. We're really blessed to have this resource on campus. Yeah, so that's where you get to go for these trainings. Um, a funny story is that my son graduated with a degree in, in fine arts and, and works now full-time in the university in that design center. So he does some of the trainings. He's not the one that would do our trainings, but um, he's there all the time and it's, he loves it. It's a really great place to work. So the application is online and it's open until uh, March 15th. I've, I put the direct link in the chat. So for the application, you need to make up and upload a current resume. Um, and then during the course of the program, after you put your application in, we have um, a survey that you take and it's to gauge your perception of science and careers in science. And then during the summer, there's another survey that you take. And then at the end of the experience, so like when you go back in the fall, there's a survey to take. And the idea is to see how your perception has changed um, because this is called Envision uh, and supposed to change your perception. So the participants will be selected by April 1st and um, then we'll get 
you onboarded, background check, everything so that you're lined up for your pay. And so the pay is actually doled out in two uh, payments. One is the first week you're there, you get uh, two thirds of your salary for the summer. So you don't have to run around begging money, you know, when you're first there, because you'll get a large chunk of your pay, you do have to space it out. And then um, the seventh week into the study, you get the, the rest of the balance of the 4,500. The move in is uh, Sunday, after, late afternoon, early evening on June 6th. And then the program starts uh, Monday, June 7th. Um, so because that uh, this program has worked out really well, the dean of the graduate college said, wow, if you're doing this recruiting, why don't you also tell students about other programs at the university? So our summer programs in engineering and computer science and composite research, biomedical engineering, marine studies, there's a list of all the different summer undergraduate opportunities at these websites. So I'll also post these in the, the chat if you wanna check out what else is available and you can apply for them. Um, so there's a bunch of these. This is just a, a small list, but the whole list is here. So this is the group from 2019. So as I mentioned, Mr. David Brown, he was from Lincoln. Um, he had never gone fishing. You know, I found this out at near the end of the summer. And since I live in Lincoln University, my, that's actually my postal address. Um, we, I took him fishing. We went out fishing and the guy caught two like big trout within an hour. I was just like, I was flabbergasted. He, I mean, he, he did really well, but uh, we had a, a good time. So a couple of these, uh, actually Gabriel Castillo has come back for uh, uh, a graduate degree. Uh, and here's some others that, from UMES. And so this is our cohort. Also UMES, Kristen was one of my students as well. Um, so this is, all right, so these are the, we got these little fidget spinners. So when we give out the jump drives and that's what these are, they're jump drives, they're four gigs. And we load up the movies on here and hand these out because people think they're cool looking bottle openers, right? So if it ever fails as a jump drive, it's still a bottle opener and the fidget spinners get the kids coming. So downstate Delaware, they're still kind of, they still like them, I guess. We'll see, I got a bunch of these things. So uh, we hand those out to kind of bring the kids over then the parents come over and they engage and you get to hand them a, a bottle opener. 